I suspect um, Dr. Cooper may have asked you this, but um, how many of you are trainees? Did you go through this with them, David? So how many of you are trainees? Okay, how many of you are endocrinologists? Okay, and how many of you, I guess you're here because you want to learn about the thyroid, correct? So how many of you have looked at thyroid ultrasounds before? How many of you have never looked at a thyroid ultrasound before? And a lot of people never raise their hands. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking about thyroid nodules and you'll be seeing lots of ultrasound images throughout the day when I later give my Meet the Professor on challenging thyroid nodules, but even if you are not doing your own ultrasound, it's very important that you work with your radiologist and you have access to look at ultrasound images. So um, as we all know, whenever we commence the evaluation of a patient with a thyroid nodule, we always check the TSH first because if the TSH is low, that's when we think about the fact that the nodule could be functioning and we do a scan to evaluate the potential for a functioning nodule causing thyroid toxicosis. But if it's not, we do a diagnostic ultrasound. And the main reason for ultrasound is risk stratification because very importantly, not every nodule requires a fine needle aspiration biopsy. And so we use the ultrasound imaging to help us to decide. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to deconstruct the ultrasound images first to look at the individual features of thyroid nodules, and then we'll put them back together in some of the commonly used ultrasound schemes for classification of nodules. So when we deconstruct and we look at the five major characteristics of thyroid nodules that are reported, and I'll go through each of these with you on the slides, we talk about echogenicity, and shown in white is the characteristic of that feature that's associated with malignancy. And so I'll show you images of different echogenicities, different calcifications or echogenic foci, how margins can look, what a shape looks like is taller than wide, and as we go through, I'll show you nodules that have different ultrasound consistencies, solid or mixed. So the first thing we usually start with is echogenicity, which is the imaging of the nodule compared to the thyroid. So, so the thyroid itself, and I'll show you some pictures, is very bright gray compared to the surrounding strap muscles, which are darker. And so the darkness or the echogenicity of the nodule is defined by comparison of how the nodule images with grayscale ultrasound compared to the background of the normal thyroid. So we can have nodules that have the same or slightly brighter echogenicity called iso or hyperechoic, or we can have hypoechogenicity, which are darker nodules. And many cancers, most of them are darker, but specificity is not great, so are many benign nodules. And people have even begun to talk about nodules that are so dark that they're as dark as the surrounding strap muscles. So this is an example of a normal thyroid. How many of you will be in the ultrasound course tomorrow? Okay, so you'll get a chance to look at thyroids and hopefully you'll see some normal thyroids. This is a normal thyroid right here. And if you look at the lobes of the thyroid on the left and the right side, you can see how bright gray they are compared to the surrounding strap muscles. So here are four hypoechoic nodules. And you can all see that the nodule is darker than the surrounding thyroid. You see that, correct? But when you look at that, even though, remember, we're deconstructing and just talking about echogenicity, you can also see there's a lot of differences besides just echogenicity. The top left nodule looks like a golf ball. It's smooth. The top right nodule looks like it can have some heterogeneity within it. And the nodules on the bottom have very irregular infiltrative borders. So you can begin to see that echogenicity, these are all hypoechoic nodules, is going to have to be combined with other features when we're talking about cancer risk. But these are all hypoechoic solid nodules. Now, this is the non-hypoechoic solid nodule. These are two nodules, different nodules, that are what we call iso or hyperechoic because their gray is the same as the background thyroid or slightly brighter. But again, there are differences here. If you look at this nodule, you can see some small black areas in it, and that's cyst fluid. So it's a nodule that has some mixed cystic areas, whereas this one is homogeneously solid. So again, echogenicity and composition is going to become important. 
And so if you have an iso or hyperechoic nodule that has these small cystic spaces, these are generally benign and often do not require aspiration. Whereas the one on the right that's isoechoic but uniformly solid, these are aspirated. And you can also see it has a slightly irregular border. And these often yield what I know you have begun to use in Sri Lanka and in India as well, the Bethesda 4 classification of a cytology that is suspicious for a follicular neoplasm. And on histology, these are often true neoplasms, whether they're adenomas or carcinomas, our pathologists have to tell us. Now, there's a different type of echogenicity, which gets confusing. But cyst fluid, which is black and shown here, is actually anechoic. An means no echoes. So anechoic means that the ultrasound wave has passed through the structure. There's no reflection back, so there are no ultrasound echoes. And this is an indication generally of cyst fluid. And sometimes many people talk about what is called comet tail artifact, which is this small smudge of bright. And that is a very benign finding, but only in a pure cyst. So comet tail artifact alone does not mean the nodule is benign. But if the comet tail artifact is in a pure cystic nodule, as it is here, this is a benign finding. And these nodules as well never need to be aspirated. So let's now, we've talked about echogenicity. Let's talk about calcifications, or what show up as echogenic foci. And many nodules, almost a third, are calcified. And when we talk about calcifications, we talk about whether the echogenic focus, the bright area, is so big that it causes what is called acoustic shadowing, meaning it's so thick that when the ultrasound wave hits the calcification, it can't pass through. So there's a shadow behind it, and I'll show you an image. So that is a dense calcification. Echogenic foci that are so big that there's no through transmission of sound versus a microcalcification, which is the one associated with malignancy, where these are very small punctate echogenic foci that are so small that the sound wave passes right through and you can image the entire nodule. And these are thought to potentially represent the somoma bodies, the calcifications you can see in thyroid cancer. So these are not very sensitive because many cancers don't have these microcalcifications, but they are quite specific. It's unusual to see a benign nodule with them. We can also have another calcification that's suspicious for malignancy called the interrupted linear calcification, and I'll show you an example. So to remind you pathologically, this is what somomatous calcifications look like in a papillary cancer, but right over there and here, but as well, you can have calcifications in other malignancies. So shown on the right is a follicular carcinoma. And here in purple is a linear calcification that surrounds the outside of the follicular carcinoma. And we know it's a follicular carcinoma because you can see the invasion of the follicular cells into the capsule, which is what capsular invasion here is what makes this be called a carcinoma by our pathologists. So here are examples of peripheral calcifications. So peripheral calcifications on the left. And again, I know there is lots of ultrasound technology out there. So some of you may be used to seeing this is the same nodule. Some of you may be looking at ultrasound images that are more like the top one, versus some of you may look at images more like the bottom one. That all has to do with the processing of the image after the ultrasound probe receives the sound waves reflected back. But this is a nodule with complete regular eggshell calcifications, which is non-suspicious. However, this is the type of calcification we worry about. So in these two different nodules, you can see that on the outside, there are some calcifications. But where the blue arrows are, you can see there's interruption in the calcification. And there's actually an area of soft tissue which indicates where the cancers have invaded through the calcification. And often, this is the area where you target your FNA. And these were both carcinomas. So the third thing we're going to talk about is margins before we put it all together. 
And as I showed you when we talked about the hypoechoic nodules, you saw the difference between the one that looked like the golf ball and the two on the bottom with the very irregular margins. So margin terminology is very challenging, but in general, margins can be well-defined and smooth or regular, or they can be irregular. And irregular means that you can see the margin. You can identify the boundary between the nodule and the normal thyroid, but it's not smooth. And there are many adjectives that have been used to describe the not smooth margin. Some are irregular, infiltrative, spiculated, or microlobulated. But they all mean the same thing, that you can clearly identify the interface between the nodule and the surrounding thyroid but it's not that smooth interface. And again, not so sensitive, but if you do it right, pretty specific. It is very unusual for a benign nodule to have a truly irregular visible margin. And this is the challenging part, because sometimes what happens is you can't see that margin. So remember, irregular means that you can see it and it's not smooth. Sometimes you cannot see the interface between the nodule and the surround, surrounding thyroid. So it's poorly defined, and I'll show you some examples. But poorly defined is not the same thing as a clear margin that is jagged and irregular. So what makes a nodule? Well, if you were to ask a medical student, how do you define a thyroid nodule on physical exam, she would tell you that it feels different when you feel the thyroid. If you ask a pathologist, They'll tell you a thyroid nodule truly has to be a neoplasm, not hyperplasia. So what makes a nodule on ultrasound? Well, it's an area that looks different. So it depends on the nodule. So if the nodule is hypoechoic, the nodule is going to look different because its gray scale imaging is different than the background thyroid. So the hypoechoic nodule is defined because it's darker than the background thyroid. But what if the nodule is the same background as the thyroid? So it has the same gray imaging as the thyroid. Then you're going to be looking for the margin, which is sometimes called the halo or the hypoechoic rim that surrounds the nodule that then makes the margin. And this is what is called the halo. It is the hypoechoic rim that surrounds the nodule that otherwise has the same grayscale image color as the background thyroid. So taking a black marker and drawing a line around the, the nodule. Now, sometimes that black line is really thin. You took a fine point black line pen and you drew it around the nodule. And this is thought to represent compressed blood vessels as the nodule gradually expands. But sometimes it's quite thick. And this is thought more to represent the fibrous capsule, like the follicular carcinoma that I showed you. And so there are many of our cancers that are encapsulated. We can have encapsulated papillary cancers, PTC follicular variants, as well as follicular and HERDL cell carcinomas. So this is an example. So if you look, the nodule is the same grayscale as the background thyroid. And what allows you to identify this as a nodule is that thin black line around it drawn with a very fine point black pen. And if we look at it with the color flow Doppler, which allows us to see blood vessels, you can see that this thin black line corresponds to compressed blood vessels. On the other hand, here's a nodule, again, the same gray color as the background thyroid. So what makes it a nodule is that black line, the halo. But you can see this one is thinner and thicker in different places. And this was actually an encapsulated follicular carcinoma. So same grayscale, but differences, very subtle differences in that black line that forms the border around the nodule. Here is a nodule that is hypoechoic. So here we can see this nodule that generally is darker than the surrounding thyroid. So a difference in the nodule echogenicity is what defines the location of the nodule. And you can see the borders, and you can see that they're quite infiltrative, spiculated, but irregular. So the difference here is that the nodule imaging on grayscale is different than the background thyroid, and the interface between the nodule and the background thyroid is the border. 
And I told you I would show you one last one. This is a very, very small, non-suspicious big cystic solid nodule, and here's another one. And here it's difficult to see the margins. So the margins are not visible, but they're not well defined. So these are poorly defined margins. It's not that they're visible and infiltrative. And you can see they're especially poorly defined where the solid portions of the nodule interface with the normal thyroid, which is pretty typical for small mixed cystic solid nodules. It's easier to see the interface where the fluid comes against the normal thyroid, but where the solid part of these nodules abuts against the normal thyroid, you just can't see it, and that's okay. So let's now turn to the fourth feature, taller than wide. So taller than wide is a characteristic that was defined predominantly based on subcentimeter nodules, and it means that this is a larger than subcentimeter nodule, but it means that in the transverse view, the nodule is taller than wide. Now it turns out that although I showed you quite a large nodule here that is taller than wide, this is actually not very good for nodules that are over one to one and a half centimeters. It's very good for picking up microcancers, and Dr. Cooper is going to talk to you about why we want to leave microcancers alone. But it's not as good for larger cancers, although I just showed you a nodule here that illustrates it. So not as helpful. So when we put these together, if we talk about microcalcifications, the irregular visible margins and taller than wide, and then hypoechoic and solid, it turns out that nodules that exhibit these three top characteristics are virtually always cancers. Benign nodules will not have microcalcifications, defined irregular margins, and a taller than wide shape. It is very unusual, so that means it has a very high specificity. That is a nodule on ultrasound that before you biopsy it is very likely to be malignant. But if you want to be sensitive and try to find most of the cancers, it's actually the hypoechoic solid nodule that can have a smooth margin and is non-calcified that is the most sensitive combination for finding cancer, but unfortunately, it's not that specific. So again, the higher likelihood of malignancy leads to a more specific pattern, but you lose sensitivity. So what we do is we now put all of these individual features, we reconstruct, and we come back to the ultrasound pattern, now that we've deconstructed to look at how they look by themselves. And the two, guide, the two that are mostly in use, at least in the United States and then worldwide, um, are the ACR TIRADS and the American Thyroid Association. And there are a number of others. I noticed that there's a poster here on the British um, system, but the other ones in use are the European system, there's a Korean system, ACE has a system, and I would like to tell you that there actually is an international thyroid nodule ultrasound work group that includes um, members from all of the major classification systems that is working on coming up with an international system, and I'm very fortunate to be part of that steering committee. But the good news is that they're all 95% the same. There's no magic here. It's we can all put the same things together and come up with the same risk patterns. So let me show you how we do that. So the ATA was one of the first, and it was based upon putting those individual features together to form patterns, recognizing that there is not independent probability in seeing all of these features together, that they're highly correlated, so that you will generally only see infiltrative margins if the nodule is hypoechoic and solid. You generally only see microcalcifications if the nodule is hypoechoic and solid. And then, by defining sonographic patterns and assigning them a certain malignancy risk, you can then come up with FNA cutoffs, uh, cutoff recommendations. And what we did was we provided the clinician sort of a photo album, an atlas of how nodules look. Well, what the radiologist did was something different. So ACR is the American College of Radiology, and TIRAD stands for the Thyroid Imaging Radiology Acquisition Data System. Um, there, for example, is BIRADS, which is how mammograms, the breast imaging radiology acquisition data system, is used. There's now a CHIRADS for kidney. There's a PIRADS for pancreas. Um, so there are many of these systems, and this is the acronym that they use. And they do something very different, though. What they do is they look at those five ultrasound features that we just reviewed, composition, echogenicity, shape, 
margins, and echogenic foci, which they call bright reflectors. And they assign points for each of those, come up with a sum, and the sum determines the risk category. And then they make recommendations for F and A, or for following the nodule. But let me just show you what this looks like for our radiologists. How many of you have seen tie rats or heard about tie rats? How many of you have never heard about tie rats? So it looks like most of you, just everyone's raising their hand very slightly, have heard about tie rats. Most of your radiologists are generally, especially I suspect in the academic centers, following tie rats because it's the way that most of the radiologists have, done, have gone. They're using this in Latin America now. They're using it in Australia. This has sort of gone viral around the world. So I think for endocrinologists, it's important that we understand how it's used. And this is what's given to the radiologists. On the top, you can see composition, echogenicity, shape, margins, and echogenic foci. You can see the number of points that are awarded to each feature within that particular category. You add them up, and you get tie rads. But they're the same. So let's start with the highest suspicion nodule. So here, you can all see now, these are hypoechoic nodules. They're darker than the surrounding thyroid. They're solid. If you were to take that pen and draw a line around them, sorry, you see over here that they have irregular margins. They're not smooth. You can see the bright spots that are microcalcifications. And this nodule even has something called extrathyroidal extension. This is TIRADS-5. It's ATA high suspicion. These nodules have a very high likelihood of being cancer, and these are generally infiltrative papillary carcinomas. So very concordant. If we come down to the next risk level, you can see that you go from over 70 to 90 percent down to 10 to 20 percent. There's a big skip. There's not linearity in the risk assignment. And this is the hypoechoic solid nodule with smooth margins. You can see the nice smooth margin around these two nodules. This is called TIRADS-4, or ATA intermediate suspicion. It's also EU TIRADS-4. And they're both vascular. And if you notice, I did not talk about vascularity, because it turns out that vascularity is not an independent predictor once you take into account the grayscale features. This is benign, and that's cancer. They look the exact same. So although most papillary cancers are dark and solid, 50% of benign nodules are dark and solid. And since they're much more common to be benign than malignant, most dark solid nodules are benign. We next come down to the third category in risk, the low suspicion, otherwise known as TIRADS3. These are the nodules that have the same echogenicity as the background thyroid. You can see that they're isoechoic. The gray scale in all five of these nodules is the same as the background thyroid. But what defines the border of the nodule is that black line. And I'm going to show you the pathologies of all five of these. So you can see the top three were all true neoplasms, benign neoplasm on the left, and two carcinomas over here. The bottom two were hyperplastic and benign. So, Although 80% of cancers are hypoechoic and dark, about 20% are not. And they have different histologies. These tend to be the follicular cancers, the hurdle cell cancers, or the PTC follicular variants. So in other words, malignancies that form follicles as part of their histology. And we'll come back to that in the ultrasound course, why it is that malignancies or why it is that we think Forming follicles is responsible for bright imaging on ultrasound. So the fourth category is something called very low suspicion, which has a very low risk of malignancy. This is actually called TIRADS-1 or sometimes TIRADS-2. It's what we call the spongiform nodule, which is defined when a nodule has more than 50% of its volume as these microcystic areas as shown here. And these are actually the ultrasound images of a hyperplastic nodule. So most growths in the thyroid are not true neoplasms, they're hyperplasia, one part of the thyroid that's been stimulated to grow. So if you look at it under the microscope, what you can see here on the bottom right is the normal thyroid with the more uniform, smaller follicular structure, whereas here on the top, you see the hyperplasia with the macro follicles. Now, colloid is fluid. Fluid images is dark. So what we think we're seeing on ultrasound with the spongiform pattern is we're just picking up these macro follicles in nodules that are hyperplastic, and these are benign. 
The problem is that here it's a nodule that is spongiform. You can see there's a bunch of bright areas in it. And people who are not as experienced call these echogenic foci microcalcifications. And they're not. They're just part of the spongiform nodule. You can see if you look at them, many of them are more linear than actually drop-like. And these are just all what we call posterior acoustic enhancements, so stay tuned for the ultrasound course tomorrow, but just areas of an ultrasound artifact called post posterior acoustic enhancement behind the small cystic spaces. So microcalcifications are virtually always found in hypoechoic solid nodules. When you have a nodule that is spongiform and you see these echogenic foci, these are not microcalcifications. And just to show you one clip of this, here's an ultrasound image of a spongiform nodule. You can even see some comet tail reverberation. And you can see that many of these echogenic areas are generally quite linear and are behind the cystic areas. The last ultrasound um, appearance is the pure cyst. These are benign. And um, these are certainly something that we don't biopsy unless we're doing an aspiration and maybe ethanol installation for symptoms. And here's the comet tail in the pure cyst. So why is an ultrasound 100% accurate? Well, first of all, our eyes see the same things and often assign different words to those. And it's been shown that the more experienced the ultrasound operator is, the less the variation is. But most ultrasounds around the world are read by people who don't just read ultrasound in radiology. They're reading ultrasound and mammography and CT and MR. And it's really experienced like it is with surgery. I know we have a surgeon in the front room. The way in surgery, it's been shown that the more procedures you do, the lower your complication rate. The more thyroid ultrasounds you do, the better your consistency is. And then again, not all cancers are the same. And I alluded to the fact that some of our cancers under the microscope form follicles, like PTC follicular variant and follicular carcinoma. And those are going to image differently than tall cell papillary cancers or classic papillary cancers. So to summarize, we can't use a single feature to be able to identify all malignant nodules, but certain combinations of those features, the sonographic patterns, are very predictive that high suspicion TIRADS5, EU TIRADS5, are very, very predictive of a nodule being cancerous. But most importantly, if a nodule lacks all of those suspicious features, which is the TIRADS1 or 2 nodule, the spongiform nodule, those nodules have a less than 3% chance of cancer and do not require a biopsy. And then in between, we can make decisions about risk stratification and come up with FNA cutoffs. Um, so how do you use our ultrasound features? Well, certainly our risk assessment with FNA is based upon the size of the nodule, how it looks on ultrasound, and most importantly, the clinical history, which includes the age of the patient and other comorbidities. And there's certainly a number of systems that have been used. But you can see two of the most commonly used ones. And these with the others, you can see how concordant they are. Um, so I'd like to end with a um, picture of Ben Franklin, who was actually the founder of my university and an avid devotee of science. Um, and I think he would be um, excited about the technology of ultrasound and all of its uses that far transcend medicine. Thank you very much.